It's finally here, round one of NRL season 2024. The Bulldogs are ready to make amends for a poor year last year. After all the new signings, a new captain, and all the rest of the drama that's happened, it's finally here, and boy, am I excited. Uh, and we're going to go through everything today. We're going to go through the teams. We're going to go through how we think uh, the Bulldogs will go up against the Eels. But we're also going to go through uh, the, the beginning of round one in Las Vegas. And obviously, to take me through everything is good old Dibbo. Welcome again, Dibbo. Welcome, mate. That was a great weekend of two games. It was, it was pretty good, man. I've got to admit, there was a lot that I liked about um, about the presentation and about the hype that they, they really tried to build. Yeah, I absolutely love the hype in the build-up. And then the first game was was a cracker. And then, yeah, the second game was poor, poor yeah, quality. Yeah, poor quality. I felt don't, like... Don't send those two teams again. Manly and South get the tick. Don't send the other two again. They had their turn. Uh, t- look, man, I, I think the stadium looked amazing. And oh. the crowd was so loud. You can hear it through the TV. And there was a lot of Americans intrigued. Like, if you went on social media yeah. and all that, um, there was a bit of a... A bit of a hiccup from Fox Sports in terms of that college game went in overtime, and then some viewers in America thought it wasn't on, um, and then just changed the channel, not realizing it was actually on. I got my one of my best mates, um, Mush. Mush, we miss you, mate. Um, he's moved over to San Fran. He got married to. Um, Doesn't matter who he got married to. Tell, tell, yeah, tell he got married to the love of his <laughs> life. No, I can confirm she's a female. Get on, anyway, bro. Get on with the story. Um, he had his in-laws over on Sunday excited to showcase on the game of rugby league you know they brought the whole food out and everything and only to put it on and it's like oh the basketball's on where is the game <laughs> you know it's only later afterwards that his in-laws were disappointed that he's realized the fox sports is going to showcase the game of the week so we'll have him over on sundays ah oh, silly man so that's all right he missed the first week he's actually excited for next week's game of the week just to show his in-laws the game of rugby league so we are getting some exposure. I mean, look, it, it, you know, th- there was a, well, I think at one point they said there was 46,000 um, that watched the game altogether. I know that they said they announced 40,000 at the game, but then later I saw it was 46,000. I don't know. I think. No, I'll tell you why. Because the first game alone had 38,000 tickets sold. Yeah. Right. And then there was more people that got the second package only for the second game. So right, more walk ins right, came right, on. Right, right. They reckon it was probably even more than 50,000. I mean, either way, that was great. And, um, you know, the, the stadium was just great. And to be honest, I saw, I thought Fox Sports did a really good job of hyping up, um, you know, these games in Las Vegas where I feel like Channel well 9. Done. Yeah, well done to Fox Sports, honestly. One thing I will say, though, is, man, I hated seeing Paul Kent there. I hated him see, seeing him back. Oh, I didn't even realize he was there. I'll tell you what, it was Fox Sports did. Thumbs up, good build up, everything. They got a good team. Like, I know Channel 9's got the star power and some of those ex players. <sighs> But they would have absolutely botched that. Uh, they I did. Then no, they did, man. I think Fox Sports did well. You, like, I gave them the thumbs up. You can hear Yvonne speaking to like Peter Valenzi. You can hear the excitement and the the like the passion in her voice for the game. And I, and I love seeing that. You know, it's like this is what you want. You want people presenting the game who love it and who are passionate about it. So you know. Oh, they all were. I thought all all the presenters um, <coughs> were excited. They you know they weren't That's being fantastic. negative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. Um, Peter Van Andrews was very, very hyped and very, oh, very pleased Andrew with himself. They were so pleased off. with themselves, man. Oh, the f- uh, from what I heard, all the fans were hugging him in the street. And, uh, <laughs> you know, good on him. So, you know, he's, uh, you know, he's, uh, previously we had CEOs that just didn't take that risk, you know, didn't know how to think outside the circle. All they did was get confrontational with the players. You got a CEO and a chairman there. So you got Vlandis and Andrew Abdo that are actually well liked by the players. You think so? Oh, hands down. I, I haven't seen players come out and get confrontational. Where during the previous eras of like Gallup, for example, and if you go back during the Super League War, players were having confrontations yeah, even, with board it, members. But even and like the CEO, Todd Greenberg and Dave Smith. Oh, like I that forgot was, about that guy as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, he had a lot of pet and he was negative as well, and a lot of players you know, didn't really appreciate him. Um, but you know. I mean, I, I don't know how many real inroads they made uh, in, in the American um, in the American market, but you know what? I think it's the right, it's the perfect first step. You know, maybe we see like an Origin game over there. I think they would really, really enjoy oh, like an Origin awesome. game. Um, but uh, there are some positive signs. Like um, t- earlier today, the San Francisco 49ers president Al Guido uh, was declared that he's interested in buying an NRL club. And he wants to sort of hype it up and build like a Netflix uh, TV show similar to um, uh, Ryan Reynolds and the Wrexham FC. And they've made like a whole series about the soccer club that they bought and it's gone worldwide. And he sort of wants to, he wants to do that because they want to own multiple um, uh, sports franchises because they, they bought Leeds now. Two, in the two candidates I can give you off the bat if you want. 
Who? Parramatta. They already got the stadium for it. They've got a large supporter base. Um, they've got a passionate supporter base. They've been starved of success for a long time. Um, they got a lot of potential there. Another large supporter base. Wouldn't hurt to have an owner. They've got a 80,000 seater stadium. Maybe they can start selling it out. Is the Canterbury Bulldogs? So these are your first two candidates. Could be, yeah, look, you know, you know, it could be, uh, you know, very big. And and to be honest, like this is the type of stuff that you want to start hearing is that people want to start investing in rugby league and in, in the NRL. And this could this could only mean good things for rugby league in America. But look, I think that you know the NRL, Peter Valandis, Andrew Abdo, they need to stick to this. They need to go the course. They need to be fully invested. You they know, are. they've done it. They have to be. You P- know, Peter Valandis reckons that. He knows he's not going to, you know, start turning over tens and millions or maybe up to $100 million in revenue in the first year. He's aiming to start seeing inroads by the second or third year. He reckons by the third year, it's probably more realistic, he'll start getting his returns for the efforts, for the investment he's made in taking the game to the USA. Because I guarantee you next year you'll get a new four sides. Yeah. I guarantee we'll get out about fifteen to 20,000 minimum Aussies or Kiwis travelling from here to go over there. I mean, each NRL side will have at least a couple of thousand of its fans travelling over. Um, I mean, even even if it takes five years to get a foothold, even a small foothold, and then you start building a new uh, competition there. Look, I, I just it's great. And I, I, I was surprised how good the f- that went. That that Manly South game had an electric start. To it was I a liked great it. Oh, the game. It was, was a very very good game. The forwards were you know no holds barred. Some good shots too. Yeah. Great right shots. I thought Latrell had a good game. He yeah. tried really really hard. Did still go missing, I, f- I felt, in, in certain periods of the game. But let me tell you, Manly surprised me. Um, yeah. uh, I, I like how they went after Kepi, you know? Yeah. And Kepi's credit kept going, you know? Man, Kepi had a really good game. He didn't he didn't like, he didn't like give in or didn't go into his shell. Um, you know, Turbo looked very good. Yeah, um, oh, Turbo, I'll tell you what. If his hands let him down or, like, his support players, yeah. their hands let them down. He could have easily had an extra three or four try assists and a few extra tries for himself. But I was very pleased with his return. Like it's very, oh, it's the old turbo. I tell you what, it's looking good for New South Wales if they can stay injury free. I will tell you yeah, that. Yeah. Um, I thought Brooks, uh, you know, he's in a better lineup. I mean, he's in a change of environment. <laughs> so he scored. He got his. Uh, I know he dropped the ball the first time. I thought, here we go. Like you know, this guy's never going to change. But I was really, credit, I was he bounced really, back. I was really happy for him, man. Like uh, just shows that he was sort of comfortable being there, comfortable um, letting you know Daly Chair Evans. Uh, run the show for him to inject himself when it was later. So, look, that was good. Um, you know who else I thought was good and I've been a big critic of him? James Tedesco. I thought he played TD very, very well. best game in a while. He had a very good game. Um, I wish T- uh, I wish South had unleashed Jai Gray at, you know, it would have been nice. I was thinking about that, actually. But where are you going to fit him? Yeah, oh, fair enough. You know, it was good to see. Have, um, um, it came with some heavy hits. Victor Radley. I know he was yeah, trying to do, well. he was trying to do the game well. a favour by trying to go well. after the players. Credit to him. I like how the referees let the game flow as well. That's a great point. That was a great, Can you guys do it, it every week? Please. That would be absolutely brilliant. Don't nitpick on those holding downs and all you know all these little infringements. Let it go. I think like in the in the first half of the Manly and Rabbitohs game, I think there was only maybe one or two penalties called. It was it was, it was really good because they were letting things go. The game was flowing. It was it and was, the hits were coming and the hits were and, and yeah, they weren't like they weren't being nitpicky either. I, th- I thought you know I th- I felt. It was really, really well um, I, refereed. I like how um, uh, Lachlan Ilias got the angle tap on Jason Saab. Oh, what so, you know, how is that in the clear? And the Americans aren't really used to seeing angle taps like that. You know, it's you know, that was be- that was well done. Gone and then, yeah. Was, oh yeah, you know. But it was honestly to see that from Lachlan Ilias, I thought it was good. I still think he um, he still got a bit of maturing to do as a seven, Lachlan Ilias. But he tried his he tries his harder every single game, and he'll be much better for it. There was, however, like a, a really, um, there was a bit of a, a dark cloud about, you know, over everything that happened in Vegas with the racism uh, issue that sort of came up in the Broncos v. Roosters game where Lenu, uh, Spencer Lenu apparently called Ezra Mam uh, a very ugly word, I think. Yeah. Ugly is the, the way to go um, about it, or, or the right description, I think. Um, you know, I thought if he did say it, whatever the NRL gives him, yeah, I reckon, well I reckon it's, yeah, it's deserved. Cause you, There's you no sh- excuse for that sort of behaviour, you know. I think if you're black, that, white, pink, exactly. yellow, it doesn't bro, matter. don't say that. Like, it just it's a condescending term. It's uh, Previously, you know, you got to see where Ezra's coming from. His pe- that term was used for his, uh, you know, against his people. That's in, right. In, in There's a, a big history to that. It's not just know, a word out of, you know, thin air. We've seen it in um, Spanish soccer in the last few years as well. Um, people of colour, basically, um, yeah. 
same things happen. They've actually gone, you know, the Spanish fans have gone and thrown bananas on the field as well. That's we, disgusting, we know it's, it's implied in a racist way. Yeah, you know? 100%, 100%. Absolutely. But it's just, it's un, it's not on. All fun and games, really. That, that's, that was actually quite horrible. And there's a report that someone that's posing as Spencer Lenu's brother, I'm not sure if it is or it isn't, but I think it is because Spencer follows oh, this account. It's, it's his cousin. It, it's a relative and he's gone on and he's sort of carried on about it and, you know, he's tagged Ezra Mam and he's put some, you know, some derogatory icons sort of referring to that. He's small-minded. It's just, it's pathetic, man. Get out of the game. Oh, but then there was there was part two to all that fracas as well. Yeah, he was confronted in the hotel. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good. Look, man, good on the oh, boys. I'm glad about up. that. Yeah, they yeah, should have uh, then, you know, got into a nice biff. That would have even got better. <laughs> look, you're sticking up for your mate and Ezra Mam is... is uh, you know, clearly upset. Whatever, look, whatever you think of um, anyone, the right? Wor- the worst is is those mental midgets who are probably more sensu- sen- sensitive than anyone and, and cry when, when uh, you know, whenever something racist is said against them. Coming out and saying, oh, he should drink a, some concrete or, you know, well, a bag enough, of yeah, cement. Yeah, shut up. Absolute mental midgets, Neanderthals. You deserve to be back in the <laughs> Did cage. Did you say mental midgets? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a really... <laughs> Really That's what they are. They are the most <laughs> sensitive people. And then to come out and say that. No, look, I agree with you. Um, you know, uh, but like, where, where do you get, like, as if you, you, you're in the NRL, it's not like you're some random off the street. You're getting so much training, so much, like, um, you know, diversity and inclusion training. You, you're literally in amongst a, a, a rugby. But the, the yeah. thing is, rugby league is so diverse. Like, there's, I think there's like people that come from seventy different countries play and rugby league, yeah. and then you get some like someone say this. And th- the thing is, Spencer and he's a minority Lenny, as well. He's, you know, he's part of the the Pacific minority. Why would you say something like that? Regardless, anyway, um, like also, what made it worse is the way the Roosters handled themselves. So they then threw Spencer to go get interviewed by yeah. two different interviewers. Yeah, ridiculous. You know, one of them's Danny Wylo, who's probably the biggest um, sports. You know, p- you know, media personality, you know, mm. amongst all the papers and and news stations. You know, I know Danny's not malicious, but you know, he's going to force. He's going to ask. He's going to talk. He's going to ask it. you the tough questions. You know, and it's just all fun and games. And then, um, on top of that, the way Robbo conducted himself at the press at the presser. You know, oh, for Ezra to say that's not right, like, yeah, you know, you're jumping to conclusions already, or you just making a non-event of the whole situation. So, look, not, I, I, not a good look for Robo because he's not that sort of person either. I'm with you, but it's, it's also tough in that situation. Like, you got to think about the context of it. He's trying to defend this player. He's not sure what's happened. You know, maybe Re- he shouldn't have commented. Maybe he should yeah, have just said, should have been more know, reserved yeah. and said, look, if it's true, I'll be disappointed. You know, he he knows to come out. Yeah, it's, it's just, it's so ugly. He just soured the, what was, I think, a great weekend of rugby league, to be honest, in, in Las Vegas. But anyway, I think, you know, we should change tact um uh, i want to talk about something a little bit more positive um so bulldogs v eels this saturday at 5 30 at uh combank stadium in Parramatta. incidentally i've gone the bulldogs on this i think you know the bulldogs are preparing for an ambush um and the eels they do look flat in the pre-season so i know it's at combank i know the eels will probably be getting comfortable thinking you know tell you the dogs tell you the dogs i hope the dogs come out with an ambush um i've gone the dogs so Something to give their fans to cheer about. Maybe pile on some misery for the Eels fans. I will. I'm going to quickly read out the team list because I think it's really important that this, you know, this is the first team list that I think the Bulldogs um, have been look, uh, you know, looking forward to for probably the most anticipated one in a very, very long time. So Blake number Taff, two, Blake Wilson. Uh, number one, Blake Taff is at fullback. Blake Wilson is at number two oh, on the yeah, wing. Yeah. Jacob Kuras will be playing inside him at centre at number three. And then you've got the captain, Stephen Crichton, at number four. Playing alongside him is Josh Adokar, which is very, very exciting. Then you've got Matt Burden at six, which we expected. And then Drew Hutchison, as expected, right, has taken the number seven from Toby Sexton. This is interesting, um, but not surprising. I, I just want to see how he combines with Matt Burden and Reid Marnie. And then to, a, obviously, a greater extent, also Blake Taff. Uh, like, I hope he does well. Taff was always going to get the first shot. I mean, he's a competitor. Um, he's pretty resilient, you know. I mean, have what do you have to his name? Half a dozen games, and he played in that grand final. He performed admirably that day. Um, I'm excited to have him there. I really think... You know, give him time. Um, I really think at his speed... He's no, he's no Luttrell, but, you know, um, he's a good option at the back. Um, he'll contribute, and he'll do well, I think. 
We've got Max King at eight, Reed Marnie at nine, Poasa Famasili at ten. He's starting prop, which I think is, is a good move. I think he played well. Oh, Ivy does well. Yeah. I mean, I remember he was at the Dragons and I always cheered him on, and Ivy goes well. Uh, Viliami Kikau at 11, Jacob Preston at 12, and then Jamin Salmon at lock. Yep. Um, now, look, a lot of people are saying Josh Curran to start at lock, Jamin Salmon on the bench. I think this makes more sense. Um, Jamin Salmon starting at lock. I think he did well in the trials, but I don't think it was enough. Or uh, I don't think you can say you can't really predict how he's going to do in a proper first grade game against a proper first grade team like the Eels. But I'm sure that the coach has been, you know, watching him train and he has the skill. There's no, he play, he's played six, he's played second row, he's played center, he's played so many different positions. I don't mind that at all. If he can link up between, on, you know, link up both sides of the field, like similar to an Isaiah Yo type player. Not exactly that, obviously, because Isaiah Yo links up the field, runs 150 meters, makes 700 tackles. We're not going to have an Isaiah but if he can do even s- re- like something similar in terms of just the attack part, I think that'll be great for the team. So I, I think it's 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 a shrewd decision by Seraldo to have him at lock. I don't. I mean, yeah, I can see why he's gone. Um, Salmon as a starting thirteen. I don't think. He'd, I mean, he's not exactly an impact player if he's come off the bench. Yeah, with you, it was more of a cover. Like, like, don't get me wrong, Curran could start. He could have played in the centres as well. The guy's actually that agile, that versatile, you know, but he offers more impact coming off the bench. Agreed. Um, like I know Sam, he could probably fit on the bench as injury cover as well because mm. he can cover, cover a number of positions, you know. So that's probably why he's got him to start at 13. I mean, it's only the first round. I'm sure some boys will really improve and force their way into the 17 or even to the starting lineup and keep the others on their toes, you know, to... To make sure they keep their position or overtake well, them. I mean, the bench is not looking too bad either, right? So we've got Kurt Mann, Samuel Hughes, Josh Curran, and Curtis Moran uh, on the bench. Now, I think Kurt Mann is a good call uh, because I think it gives the opportunity for Reed Money to potentially. Um, he can go into the into hooking role to Kurt Mann. Yeah, hundred and gives Reed Money. You can maybe play Give Reed Money. Money a breather. Yeah, sixty minutes. You can play him potentially sixty minutes. Sixty-five. Um, yeah. Yeah, sixty-five that minutes. Impor- important breather. Yeah. Um, I think the other thing with Kurt Mann is that he covers so many positions: fullback, you know, six. I mean, he's other he's other clubs of utilities. It, it's nice to have. I just we've outlined in previous weeks, and probably all sick and tired of hearing of it. Um, it's great. He's got those utilities. Great signings. I just wish he had more big boppers to fill up those specialist roles. You know. Um, Interesting over the... Um, I over just wish your 17 in this lineup was another big body, but anyways. Look, uh, Kurt Mo- Kurt, Kurt Mo- uh, Curtis Moran comes in, provides a lot of energy, does provide go forward. Sure, he's not the biggest. I'm not going to pretend like he's a big body, but I think he's a good cover until... Um, he's very powerful like for such a small uh, man. Definitely has a lot, of, a lot of bite. Physically, yeah. Has a lot of bite. I mean, could, could see Harrison Edwards there potentially because he's a bit of a bigger body. Um, instead of Curtis Moran, but and you got your other favorite. What's his name? K- Kirioga or something? Uh, yeah, uh, Kirioni Katonga. Katonga, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Katonga. Katonga will get his chance. Any other forwards you got? Don't mention Liam Knight. So anyone else? <laughs> Liam Knight. I think it was obvious he wasn't going to start. He just had that bad of a trial. Um. So yeah, over the um over the last week we've signed Zane Teravano, Jaden Ockenbo, uh, mate, <laughs> and uh, Daniel Saluka for feeder. Yeah, all right. Um, look, they're probably both at this point just um, depth signings, but Daniel Saluka Fafida is still uh, out recovering from an ACL until May, so we may not see him in the lineup for a few months yet. Um, one surprise I thought, well, not not a surprise, uh, but one thing that a lot of uh, people were saying that they're, they're uh, surprised not to see is Bronson Cherry, even though I didn't think he would get chosen. I think that he still needs a few weeks in. Because uh, he looked good in, like, he looked like he was, you know, ready to compete at the top level in the trials. He, I mean, he did. He uh, did he, well, too. Yeah, he, he had, what, 150 may- and 170 metres. He did very well. Maybe Cam's not trying to rush him, give him another month or two in the reserves, which is fair enough to get his body more conditioned, you know. I think he gets more there. More match but, hardened. But I think the question is, who misses out? It's like he wasn't away for four years. Just the impact, like you know, the hits and everything. He, he did very well, but but yeah. seriously, who misses out? Do you? Blake Wilson played excellent last year. Had great trials. I just thought I didn't realize J- um, Jacob Kuras was going to be back. Um, you know, this round. Mm. Uh, and Blake Wilson's gun is fast, right? He's very I just fast. thought, like, just to help your forwards, like, say Sherry's in top-notch form, you know, and he's continuous. You put Kuras on the wing because you know he was a powerhouse at the wing. I'm not taking anything away from him being in the centres, but he's also 
it's extremely effective on the wing. Mm. He's, so you'd have those two and they just would eat meters for you guys. And it's like they're two extra forwards, you know, they really help out your forwards coming out of, you know, from the deep in their own half, you know, coming out of the danger end. They would like literally relieve your forwards and give him a rest. Look, I, I do agree with you considering that Blake Taff is a bit, a bit of a smaller f uh, fullback. But if you look at Blake Wilson, Jake Keraz and, and uh, Stephen Crichton, they'll all run 150 metres a game. Like, if you remember, like, I, I'm not trying to say they're in his, in his league, but they can basically do pretty much what he does. Do you remember, like, you kick the ball deep and then Greg Inglis gets the ball. And I was like, oh, my God. I've got this six foot three, yeah. 105 kilo fullback who runs as fast as a winger. You know, and it's the same thing. Like, Jacob Carreras is a damaging runner. Mm. And so is, Jay, you know, Bronson Sherry. They'll be, you know, coming but out of your, whether they're getting a kick return or whether they're taking the first up or the first scoop. Look, right. I, again, I just don't think that you can um, leave Kiraz or Wilson out. That's the truth. I'm not saying leave Kiraz out here. So, my plan was if Sherry's in hot form and Kiraz is in hot form, then, you know, Blake would have to make way. But obviously, you keep him at your club because... Yeah, but, I, but I don't think you can. I think Blake Wilson, as a winger, has been so good for us. You know, he scored that hat-trick against the Rabbitohs. He's been everywhere. Like, even in the trials, he ran for, you know, averaging 150, 160 metres. So, you've got Blake Wilson, Jacob Kira, Stephen Crichton, who eat up the metres. Um, oh, I, I just think with bigger bodies and power running, those um, Kiraz and, and Sherry are going to be really damaging for teams. They'll force a lot of missed tackles. They're big bodies. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, look. I hope they both stay healthy this year. It'll be interesting. Same. And, uh, and they get utilised together. So just, just to say, obviously you've got um, Crichton and um, Crichton and um, Adokar will be on the same side. Yeah, Crichton Jeez, and Adokar on the same side. Deadly. Same okay. side as uh, Vidalmi Kikau as well. Jeez, that's going to be the portion of Ferrari next week. I mean, I mean, let's hope that they can combine well with Burden and just kill. Le le that should be the most de deadly side in the competition. If you if you want to talk superstar power and capability, it that was, should be the most deadly it side. It was in looking the competition. great till we mentioned Burden. Cut, cut. Nah. <laughs> um, I, I think you know the other one that's sort of uh, is not being mentioned is Jake Turpin. Uh, sorry, uh, Connor Tracy, right? Connor Tracy slots in there somewhere as well. He's, He's too, too good. Injured. I know he's he's in the reserves, so it means that he but was he, he didn't play any of the pre. He didn't play, but neither did Kiraz. He probably was ready to go, but they. Yeah, so I mean, he's another one that can slot in somewhere. Thinking, I thought Sherry was going to play because I didn't realize Jacob was going to be available. But you yeah. know what? You just hope. Um, like, I hate to say this, like, oh, we'll see him in first grade sooner. If we're going to see him in first grade sooner, it either means Canterbury's going to be losing games, poor form, or injuries, and I don't want to say that. Like if I want to see him in first grade soon, it's because they're absolutely killing it in reserves mm. that they can't ignore him for first. And, you know, and that's with Canterbury doing well. Look, I, know, just want I, us to, <laughs> I just want us to play well for this first game. I, I mean, don't, yeah, I don't want to be coming in week in, week out for the first two months with a, you know, depressed co-host. <laughs> <laughs> what can I do? I mean, you remember last year, we started off, you know, we won two of the first three or something and then it just, it just shat itself. We then, we lost like, 50 in a row um now <coughs> it's interesting i think coming up against the eels you know so early because for me it it will test our defense that because because if we're going to make any moves forward if we're going to advance as a team if we're going to move off the bottom of the ladder our defense needs to be right we most will, important we oh if your defense hold we were the That's worst defensive won. team last year, yep. right? And I think we've been like the worst defensive team or, or just about the worst defensive team for the last four or five years. If our defense can hold against the Eels and our fitness can show in the last 20, we give ourselves every chance to win this game. I know the Eels are an impressive team. Honestly, I'm not taking anything away from the Eels, but I don't, um, don't want to underestimate our team either. I think we have absolute attack. We have some great attack in our team. But it's our defense that's going to make all the difference. I like how you've, you've touched on defense. Can I ask, I don't know if you do know, but what, I mean, what's Cameron Seraldo done this year or in the offseason to improve the defense? Has he brought new personnel in? Has he approached training in a different way? Like, well, what's happened? I, I think, um, and this is like considering everything, uh, considering like all the different interviews that I've, I've heard and read from, you know, from Seraldo, from the players, from Gould. And one of the things that I think they aimed with buying all these new players is about attitude and it's about training. I know that, you know, how much can that possibly change? But actually attitude, 
last year was probably the worst thing that we had. We didn't, you know, we shouldn't have lost 66 nil to the Knights. They weren't that much better than us. For example, even, even for example, you look at us getting blown off the park by the forwards. Sure, our forwards, we probably wouldn't have won those games. But to lose by 40 points, 50 points, to get blown off the park, that's an attitude thing, right? And, and I think the new um, players that have come in... More experience, ...have too. brought in... A lot more experience. Uh, that actually does come with experience, but they brought that attitude. Like, Kurt, man, I thought when he came on against the Sharks, in attack, I thought he felt a little bit lost. But in defense, he added a lot of starch. He made those really important tackles for us. I think he's will do really well in defense. It's your yeah, attack I'm keen to see. That's where I was saying, I think, last week or the week before, if you guys get your defense right, they're going to they're gonna save you in a lot of games where you aren't expected to win. Absolutely. You know, he's got some, he's got some you know, current defense well, man. Salmon's experienced enough. Critter, great in the centers. Hacho's Hutch, a, a, an absolute... He's a big body, he's yeah. He's a big body, but he digs in, right? Yeah. Makes a lot of tackles. I think you guys got the biggest halves combination ever. That is a... Ma- actually, you're right. It's a well, massive like halves combination. Each. Yeah, I think something like that. Um, but I mean, you know, even even if you look at how poor we were defensively on the edges, you look at... You've got Stephen Crichton on one side and you've got Jacob Kiraz on the other, right, in our, in our centers, who I, I think both have shown that they could be, or that they are great, oh, Stephen Crichton without saying, but even Jacob Kiraz, he's a great defender, right? Reads the, the ball very well. And I think Wilson as well is very quick and they they can combine well. So if we can get our edges right, and Jacob Preston is already, you know, one of the best second roles to ever play the game. Um, <laughs> but I think, you know, as long as we can see uh, them combining and speaking well and defending, honestly, I feel like while, while I don't know we'll, if we win the game, especially because this team, the Eels, has had a lot more time to gel from their fullback to the half, 5-8, whereas we're still gelling, we may not have enough chemistry to win. I think that if we can defend well, we can keep them, we can keep it to a very uh, low score, right? As in, we can maybe grind out a win. Of not course. saying we will, yeah. but... It's a Wayne Bennett special, grind out a win. I think have the attack going, have your defence going, grind out the win. Um who have Parramatta line named in their lineup? Um, you have it? Yeah, yeah. So, so they mi- they're missing uh, Mike Azevo is out for three weeks. So they've got oh. Morgan Harper in the centres up against Stephen Crider and then Sean Russell uh, on that wing, yep. lining up against Ado Carr, Moses Brown. Uh, so Brown is six. Moses uh, Regan Gamble Gillard Lassick. The, they've got at nine. Who's the okay? So that's uh, not uh, Freddie Lassick. So you got obviously Gutho at fullback. Who's the other wing centre part, partnering? Oh, B- Simonson and Penasini. Oh yeah, yeah, they're good. They're good. Yeah, they're hard workers, but um, they are prone. They are prone to defensive lapses. Yeah, of course. You know, I know. Yeah, no, you're right. Simonson himself, I think, can have a defensive lapse and can come even Penasini. I think Penasini is very dangerous in attack. So, um, who are the wingers against? So you got Russell and uh, Simonson, and then the centers are oh, Penasini. Simonson in the wing. Yeah, yeah, and and Penasini and Harper in the centers. Right, I thought it'd been the other way around. Harper on the wing, maybe. And then who's their forward pack besides Slusik? So they've got Regan Gamble Gillard, Junior Bowler, Sean Lane, Bryce Cartwright, and Jermaine Hopgood. Hopgood goes. What happened to Brendan Hands? Hands is on the bench with Madison, Offa Hingawi, and Tualangi. Oh, yeah. And then who was the four? Sorry, who was the other one? You got Offa Hingawi, Tualangi, yep. Madison, yep. and Brendan Hands on the bench. Oh, they got a stacked four. See? They've got a stacked fourth pack. I might have to change my tip now. I mean, they do have a stacked fourth pack. That's what I mean. Look look at that. That gives me... like I'm just thinking you guys are going to be, like, you know, ambush them. But then they've got an extensive fourth pack on the bench. I'm with you. But if you look at pound for pound on the bench, right? We've got Josh Current. You can't deny his capabilities. Curtis Moran, you know what you get from him. Maybe not the best, but we'll provide go for no, him energy. I'm not energy. saying he's not the best, but those all those guys are just... Two big bodies for him to be able to contain on it for an extended period. But Sam Sam Hughes and Josh Curran are big boys. Oh, of course, they're big boys. Of I, course. I, I'm I'm actually really excited to see. You've got four big boppers. I find Gowie's, you know, Madison. He can play in the halves. Tualangi. Tualangi and Kelma Tualangi and um, hands. What one of the things that I'm very excited to see hands is our and fitness. Hopgood. Wow, yeah, our fitness. Yeah, who's your who's the new fitness guru? You were saying. Ah, uh, I forgot what his name was. I didn't. I haven't written it down. But th- that's for me. Like, I just want to see what their fitness is like. If they can defend well and come 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 home strong in the last twenty minutes, that for me will be good enough. Even did if they, we lose. Did they look tired in the trials, or you couldn't really tell because they were coming on and off? 
Yeah, they were coming on and off, but I, but I felt like they were able to maintain the intensity <laughs> for <laughs> longer periods than, say, last year. Right, because last year, even in the first half, you would see them falling off tackles. You would, see, even though they did miss a lot of tackles, I still felt they had the energy to scramble. That was the big difference. Whereas last year, you'd feel like they weren't able to scramble. They weren't able to ma- make those last ditch efforts. So you know, I'm, I am excited to see how that makes a big difference for us. Um, you know, I just want to. I'm just so keen to see Famasuli and Samuel use play in the forwards. I want to see if they're going to be. Are they? It? For us this year, uh, can they do well for us? Can they at least keep up, if not exceed expectation? That for me is is the most important. And then I want to see how do oh, what are our last what are our fifth play options? Is Drew Hutchison going to be it? Because we need to see more from our halves. Last year I felt was a disjointed year, and I'm not judging uh, burden on it. I still believe that we can we can get a lot out, but it's it's all about Drew Hutchison. How does he control the game? Um, how is his passing, you know, what are his fifth um, tackle options? That That is where mo- sort of I'm, I'm, s- I'm sort of less worried about our forwards than I am about our half, to be honest. That's s- I, I still feel like uh, Hutchison is a bit of an unknown quantity at playing full-time as seven uh, for a club. It's just strange because about a decade ago, he got, like, I, t- I think we've touched on it before, he got the under-20s player of the year and it was, uh, was out at halfback. You know, and then since his first grade career, he hasn't, He's hardly played there. That's the problem. And he yeah. hasn't had time to He's been really... He's like a yeah. centre, a lock, maybe a fullback as well. Mm. Yeah, he's played in some strange he's positions. So many, yeah. yeah. Um, the other thing that I, I think will make a big difference to us is leadership. So last year we had Burden and Mani there. Um, and I feel like they were very young and they were very new to that position. And they probably took on more responsibility than they could handle at that point. And I feel like that affected Miney's game a little bit. So I'm very interested to see how we go on the field with Crichton as our captain. Um, and, and and how does this free up Miney and Burden to sort of play the natural game? I, I'd have Kurt Mann as your second in charge. He's he's another. He should be another leader of the club. On the bench? I don't oh, I'm just saying even off the field. like He should be in the leadership group. Yeah. He's been around extremely long at some good clubs too. He was at Melbourne. Um, you know, he played he played finals with the Dragons. People f- seem to forget that. Mm. Played finals with the Knights. He's been around for a while. He's a good player. He's fair income good player. And at the Knights, he was part of the leadership group as well. He's a competitor. Uh, look, I'm, I'm very happy for him to be, you know, and on he, the And bench. he keeps his, he's a clean nose. He like keeps himself out of trouble. And yeah, he'd be good for a leadership. I'm not saying captain. I'm just saying part of the leadership group. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, look, we, we have a lot of sort of spiritual leaders. You know, you've got the you've got Kikau, you've got Fox. Uh, you know, Kikau's another one. Like, I want to see him come out there and put some... I want to see him put some, you know, shots on I Sean Lane. I want to see him uh, pressure Cartwright. Like, I want to see involvement, a lot of involvement. Yeah, same. I just want to see that involvement. Whether he's putting shots or not, I just want to see a lot of involvement with impact, obviously, but yeah. Um, And, and look, my, my, my prediction is dogs by 10. I was waiting for you to say 16. Not bad. Dogs by 10. Well, I went to dogs before the game after you read that lineup. <laughs> I mean, I didn't realize Parramatta had lined the name the extensive lineup. I mean, I have dogs by eight, but I feel like just reversing it now and going the other way. Now I got to call, got to call dogs by ten. And look, to be honest, if they do win by ten, I think that'll I'm be. I'm just gonna give no answer on this. <laughs> <laughs> Bloody hell! Um, I think that sort of brings us to the. I'm end gonna of the stick podcast. to the dogs. All right, are you happy? All right, all right. You dogs better stick by to eight. Dogs. All right, let's see how we go. Um, and, and with that, we've sort of we've come to the end of the podcast. Um, if you have sort of made it all this way, please like and subscribe. Uh, you know, we'll be doing these previews every single week and then we'll be reviewing the game as well every single week. Really, really look forward to the season. Um, you know, whoever you you support, I hope they do well. Unless you support the Eels, I hope they always do badly. Um, and, you know, um, leave some comments down below what you think of the of the lineup and how you think the doggies will go this first week. Good start by the NRL Dogs Eels first round. Hopefully they get a sellout. Is it sold out? I don't know if it's sold out, but I'll sell out. I'd imagine it'd be quite packed. It'll, uh, it'll, it'll be, be a, a great sellout. season. Get it'll be there. a great it's a good stadium. Wonderful stadium. One of the best. Um, and look, thank you so much for joining us once again, Dibbo. Thank you very much. No worries. Always a pleasure. Have a good one.